Hi, I'm Gregory Grubbs, and the purpose of today's session is to utilize, learn to utilize SSH, SSH agent, and agent forwarding, as well as SOX proxies to make your life on the cloud clusters that you deal with at least 47% better. So let's uh, get into uh, what, the, uh, what the topic is all about. When you have a cluster placed on the cloud, and, and we're, we're talking today about uh, AWS EMR cloud or, uh, or other types of uh, Hadoop clusters or Mesos clusters that you would have on AWS or Google Cloud Platform. And on any type of uh, scenario, you're, you're likely to have something that looks like the chart here. So you've got an internal network of uh, Class C addresses for your instances. And one or more of those instances may have also a public IP address, but the way the firewall rules are set up, only one will have access to come into from the uh, external network. So, so in this case, the simplest scenario would be, we've got a cluster, let's say a, a Hadoop and or Spark cluster, and, and there's a master node designated. So a master or edge node, or it might be called, it might be a more complex architecture where you have uh, a gateway and then uh, a more sealed off internal network. Uh, but one way or another, you're going to have a machine that can be accessed from the outside and only one of them. And that machine has access to all of the other instances uh, that make up the cluster. So what we're going to do is learn how the best way to do access to that for, for one thing, there's access via SSH, which is one annoyance. And another annoyance is the multitude of web ports that our cluster is going to have, not only on the master node, but also on the worker nodes, because the, the web interface might go off to, uh, when you start with the resource manager, for instance, the links that it creates will be internal addresses, and some of them will be to, uh, to services running on nodes other than the master. So the SOX proxy is, is our answer to that. Our answer should never be to punch a bunch of holes for general access to, from the world into our firewall. So that's what we're going to avoid with, uh, with a smart use of the SOX proxy and what, uh, what is known as an auto configuration file. Okay, so uh, just kind of as an overview of what we'll be dealing with, uh, we're going to be using SSH agent with forwarding to make SSH access seamless, not only to the master node, but to all the nodes within the cluster. Uh, we are not going to open ports in the firewall. We're going to use SOX proxy instead. And we're going to use what's called a, a proxy auto configuration file or .pack file that will work across browsers and across operating systems. A lot of the solutions that you'll find on the internet from the cloud providers will say, well, use, use Firefox in particular with the Foxy proxy and just configure that. Well, that works only for that particular uh, browser and it's not a general solution. So I, you know, I think this is a, a much better one once you get your head around it. It's a much nicer way to deal with these things. And then uh, the proxy pack uh, rules that I will provide uh, will work for AWS and Google Cloud Platform, and it should be quite evident how to modify it for other cloud providers uh, in the future. All right, so the way I'm going to do this is we're going to launch a cluster, and then we're going to access it as I show the problems that you encounter and then the solutions to them. So what we'll start with is we're on AWS. We'll go to EMR. Elastic MapReduce so that we can create a cluster. And I'm going to use advanced options because I want to use a private network uh, for this cluster. So let me choose Spark. We'll go to the next step. And it tells me I don't have any VPCs. So this is the virtual private cloud, the term for the private network configuration that uh, Amazon Web Services uses. So we'll ask to create a VPC. And it takes me to a new tab. Uh, I'll do it the simplest way possible. Start the VPC wizard and choose the simplest 
type of network. So this will be something that will uh, match the, the uh, chart that I showed in the beginning. And you specify a sitter. This is some sort of a, a range of class C addresses. And uh, what we have available here is, is an overall network and then one or more subnets that we can put into, uh, into that sitter block. So what we have available with the 16 mask is 256 times 256 minus five addresses. Uh, Amazon, I believe, reserves uh, somewhat like something like five addresses per uh, subnet. Uh, so we'll call this, let's just call it bogus VPC, and we'll go ahead and use the first subnet, the one that start that has the dot zero range with the 24 mask. So that gives us 256 minus five addresses, more than we need. No preference for availability zone. And then I'm not going to do anything with these other uh, aspects to it. Uh, the, the important thing to know is that the terminology will vary between cloud providers, but the concepts remain the same. Uh, blocks of addresses, subnets, and uh, routing between them. So, so uh, you know, I don't want to get specific, too specific with Amazon here. So it creates a VPC. I close this tab and go back here. Unfortunately, it's going to make me refresh the page because it doesn't know I created that. So I'll start from square one here. But this time when I come to the second step, I see Bogus VPC uh, and our subnet. It's going to put us in US West 2B, that's fine. And I'll give it uh, a count of three core nodes, core, slave, worker nodes, whatever you want to call them, uh, because that will match our chart. And go to the next step. Name our cluster Lemon Cheeks because that's clearly the best name for a cluster. We don't need these other things. I certainly don't need termination protection. And we'll go to next. And this is where we choose our key pair. Very, very important. If you don't do this, you won't be able to uh, use SSH to get into any of the machines. And at this point, we'll create the cluster and come back once it's ready. Okay, our cluster is up and in the waiting state, which in EMR terms is very good. It's waiting for us to do something with it. So let us go and see what we have here. When I look at the instances, I see that we have four running instances, and I'm interested in looking at the security group which is here. So this says slave, slave, master, or slave, worker, core, whatever you want to call it. And this one is the master. So I will annotate it. And then let's take a look at those firewall rules. So although it looks like a lot of perm permissiveness with all these ports, you, if, you, if you look at it, it's mostly about internal machines talking to internal machines. So the internal machines can ping each other. All ports are open to, uh, to these things. What I'm not seeing is a rule that allows us access from outside. So sometimes uh, the, the group, the security group will be created so that you do have that access, sometimes not. In this case, since it's not, I'm going to have to add it explicitly. So add rule for SSH, and then I'm going to make it available only from my own home network. Uh, if you put it anywhere, then that, mean, that simply means that anyone from the internet will be able to, to connect to the port, the SSH port on this instance. Uh, it doesn't mean that they have the, the correct uh, credentials to get in, but um, uh, this is just for a little bit of extra security. So we'll make that change. And then going back to our instances, I'm going to nab the public IP address for this. And then we're going to see what our problem looks like. So I'm going to follow the EC2 documentation uh, 
information for how to do this. So I'm going to use my Xanflorp key that I created the cluster with and log in as EC2 user at that address. And sure enough, I'm in. So the first problem we'll encounter is I'm in, but I don't have access to my uh, to my worker nodes. And let's just take a look at that. And I will uh, just get the uh, first part of these things. Let's see. Let's look for name. And I'll, I won't uh, go further grabbing the IP addresses, but I see that we've got 113, 114, and 115 are our worker nodes. So let's try to uh, get onto one of those. I'll go to 113. And it doesn't let me on. Why is that? It's because I don't have my key available on this machine. What you'll find on the internet is usually copy your .pem file to all of the nodes. Well, that's a painful thing. There's a much, much better way to do it. Uh, let me exit out of that shell, and let's go back uh, to our command. What I want to do is, uh, let me uh, just uh, look, here, look at that command. Okay, what I want to do is start an agent. So this, this is something that OpenSSH provides. Uh, it's, as you can see, it's available in SIGWIN. It's available in Linux. It's available in OS X. Uh, and it allows you to store your keys securely so that, so that your keys are presented wherever you're going to uh, try to connect to in a way that doesn't expose them in a file and doesn't expose them to someone using PS. Uh, and what we'll, what we'll do is it will add your default key and then any other additional keys like my Xanflor. And then it will present those. So let me uh, repeat our SSH command this time. But I'm going to take out the uh, dash I option and not actually specify a key. So I'm just going to say SSH to this particular instance and it lets me write in. So never again am I going to have to type the, uh, uh, the passphrase uh, or anything like that. However, I still have the problem that I can't get to my other nodes. So let's fix that. I'll exit out again, and then I'm going to add one parameter to the SSH command, and that's the uppercase A, which means agent forwarding. So whatever, if I'm using an agent, then forward that to the machine I'm going to. And this time I can type SSH add dash list. And I see that my Xanflorp key and my default key that my SSH agent are managing for me are available. So when I try to SSH to the, to the core node now, it works. And we'll go to 114 and it works. And go to 115 and it works. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, so on OS 10, it might be called key ring, uh, uh, key chain, something like that. Uh, uh, but it's the same, it's the same uh, agent, it's the same concept uh, that works across OSs. All right, so now that we've solved that, the next thing that we're going to encounter is a problem getting to ports from our web browser. And as an example, I have a page up here uh, with the ports on uh, EMR version 3 and version 4. So we know for sure that, for instance, that we're going to need the resource manager, uh, the resource manager web app to kind of start with, get, get a list of our jobs, start clicking around and uh, getting in for information about our jobs. Uh, Spark has its own ports. Uh, we might need to browse the file system with one of the uh, data node ports, and this might these services might be running on the master node, or they might be running on any of the other nodes. Plus, the links that the resource manager gives us will likely be internal addresses that can't even be accessed from the outside. So what do we do? Obviously, 
punching a bunch of holes in the firewall is a bad idea overall. Plus, it doesn't even work for the internal addresses. So the SOX proxy is our answer to all of those things. And I'm going to start a few jobs so that we'll have something to look at and we'll come back in a few. Okay, I have run a MapReduce job and a couple Spark jobs now, so we've got something to look at. So when we go back, our first uh, interest is we're going to go to this uh, resource manager web app address, which is port 8088 on EMR4. So that will be on the master node. So let's copy that public address and open a tab up in our browser and go to visit it port 8088 and it will try but we can't go and you'll get one or another message from that it might just be uh, port inaccessible uh, in my case I already have the proxy uh, URL defined but I don't have the proxy service set up so I get unable to connect to proxy server so let's go see how to fix that and to do that, I'm going to start out showing you the proxy auto configuration file. That file is a .pac, and it's something that is, uh, that is implemented across uh, operating systems, as I had mentioned, and all browsers, almost all browsers, will respect it. Uh, it's a set of rules or what should go through the proxy and what should not go through the proxy and possibly what type of proxy it is. So I'm starting off in the file that I'm giving everyone here with an exemption for local URLs. So you can change this as you wish. It's actually not strictly necessary the way this is set up, uh, which I'll explain. So my internal home domain is .magichome. So anything that matches, anytime a host matches .magichome in a URL, we know to get simply immediately return direct. So do not go through the proxy, go direct. Uh, for, you can also, uh, this is just an example of how to exempt local address rate ranges for the same uh, purpose. And then we get to matching AWS and Google Cloud URIs. So, if we're going to, we're going to say if the host matches EC2 master or if it matches a .amazonaws.com and has EC2 somewhere in it, or if it is star.internal. So it, uh, both EC2 and Google Cloud uh, Compute Engine instances will end with .internal for the internal addresses. So in that case, we're going to return, it's a SOX5 types of, type of service, localhost port 8157. So as you'll see, we're going to expose a, a port on our local host uh, that I'm arbitrarily choosing to be 8157 here, and that must match the, uh, the parameter that we, we're going to add to our SSH command and it means that it will go through, and the service is actually running on the remote host, but the port 8157 is local. And the remote host will be responsible for resolving the DNS requests and the IP uh, access requests. So there's also just another uh, thing. This is not going to be uh, useful to us, but if it's a 10 dot star address, uh, try the proxy first. If that fails, then go direct. So now we've seen all the types of returns that we can get from our functions. And then if anything doesn't match uh, any of the above, simply go direct. So this, this rule down here at the bottom is the reason why these rules for exempting local addresses aren't strictly necessary, because any other address isn't going to match our specifics for our cloud services Therefore, it's going to uh, end up at this rule uh, by default. But I wanted to show uh, the whole thing just so, you know, that you, your proxy.pack can be quite a simple file, in fact. Uh, and then on, I'll have a slide at the end showing the different OSs and, and, and where you specify to use this. It's dead simple on Linux, dead simple on OS X, and it's weird on Windows. 
um, like so very many things, which is why I wanted to show this on Windows. So on Windows, you go to Internet Options, then the Connections tab, then the LAN Settings, and you want to make sure that you have something under this automatic configuration script. So I've got a file URI that points to my proxy.pac file, and that's file colon three slashes, <laughs> C colon, slash, users, gcrubs, etc., uh, up to where my proxy pack resides. Uh, there is, this URI is POSIXly correct, uh, where you have uh, the equivalent of a root uh, address on, on Linux, uh, where you would have uh, three slashes, and then the uh, drive designator on Windows, and, and so forth. But some of the browsers will like this URL, and some of them will like two slashes. So the way to make it work in all cases is to use a simple web server like mongoose.exe uh, to just serve up the files in a particular directory and make this into an HTTP URI, URI instead. And uh, that will work across all browsers without any kind of fiddling. So I uh, just wanted to point that out. I'm not actually going to do that. I'm going to use uh, the three slashes, Chrome, by the way, is happy with three or two slashes, uh, Firefox, Internet Explorer, Safari, etc. Uh, your mileage may vary. So we'll set that. We've got uh, one more thing to do to actually make the service work. I'm going to exit out of our shell, and I'm going to add one parameter, which is uppercase D8157. And that, the uppercase D stands for SOX proxy somehow. Uh, so it, it says, run it on my local port 8157. So when I d execute this command now, not only do I have an interactive shell, I also have the proxy service running. So let's tab back to our browser. Uh, I, uh, it, it already refreshed so we can see that it works. Uh, so... Uh, I have my, uh, my resource manager list now. If I uh, let's just click on some links and, uh, and see, uh, make sure that things work. Um, interested in maybe one of my other jobs. Uh, one of the things that we can notice is that in some cases, the links are actually to internal addresses. So this is IP-10-0-0-75 blah, 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 dot internal. So those dot internals match the one of the rules in our uh, PAC file, which says go through the proxy. And the proxy handles the uh, address resolution, and it handles piping through the results into our browser. So uh, this is the miracle of the, um, of the proxy usage. And uh, it means that you do not have to, to pop holes in the firewall. Popping holes in the firewall as general access, like a large range of addresses to all internet address, uh, or a large ra range of ports to all internet addresses, is something that the cloud providers will send robots after you. They'll, they'll be angry and, and send you uh, uh, unhappy emails. And very soon, it may actually be impossible to make those general openness rules uh, in the firewall on cloud environments. So bad idea anyway, and a proxy makes it all seamless and uh, is not difficult to deal with. So uh, I really think that should be the pre preferred way, and I wish all the uh, internet documentation would go that way. So to recap, what we've learned today is that SSH agent with agent forwarding is a seamless way to have access across all of the instances in your uh, private network uh, on the cloud. Uh, you should not open ports in the firewall. Instead, use a SOX proxy. Use a .pac file, which works across browsers and OSs, and, uh, and that we're already set up for AWS and Google Cloud Platform. If there are uh, different, different uh, host conventions and, and uh, IP ranges and so forth, uh, you can deal with them by simply uh, adding some rules in, in the given .pac. Uh, 
I want to add one more thing for the OS specific. So on Windows, you go to Internet Options, Connections, LAN Settings, Automatic Configuration, as we saw, and use a file or an HTTP URI. Uh, on Linux, it's simply a matter of setting the auto underscore proxy environment variable. And on OS 10, which I uh, will have in a couple weeks, but I haven't had access to OS 10 for a while, uh, but I'm told that this is the way you go to it. You uh, open system preferences, network, choose your interface, whether it's the Wi-Fi or the Ethernet, uh, advanced proxies, and then go to automatic uh, proxy configuration and do the same type of thing. So I uh, hope this was helpful, and um, please subscribe to my channel on YouTube, uh, gregory.grubs at gmail.com, and have a great day. Thanks.